residents weigh in on city budget plans. Thunder Bay's mayor addresses the rift with the Chamber of Commerce. And the Olympic torch arrives in Sochi. Good evening and thank you for being with us tonight. Members of Thunder Bay City Council were on the defenses last evening as they were hit with a barrage of criticism. The 2014 budget deliberations kicked off with the public pre-budget consultation. A dozen different ratepayers and groups spoke and many were critical of another tax levy increase. Dennis Ward has more. And I don't think you guys take us seriously when we say quit spending our money. Joanne Richard is a regular at City Hall come budget season. She wanted to start her deputation by providing cost-saving ideas, but said what's the point when council never takes the suggestions brought forward? Her recommendation for local politicians was to say no to projects once in a while. You guys call this the infrastructure council. No, you guys are the big spender council, and a lot of people have said that, not just me. I talk to a lot of people, they say it's just spend, 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 and they're tired of it because then their property taxes keep going up every year. Councillor Aldo Roberto says he understands nobody wants to pay higher taxes, including him and his colleagues. But nobody wants to cut any services. Everybody wants the sidewalks plowed. Everybody wants the police there. Everybody wants the fire there, the ambulance. When we look at our surveys, when we ask the people, nobody ever says cut Cut this, cut that. Concerned taxpayer Frank Armiento accused council and administration of making the budget numbers dance in their favor. He says a proposed 3.45 tax levy increase is just too high. This is an election year and I believe people will be following this budget closer. Do the right thing, reduce the tax increases. We cannot afford these increases anymore. This is a burden to the homeowner and the local business. Some on council at different points of the night engaged in debate with deputants, something that is not allowed, so they often relied on administration to present their case. City manager Tim Camisso said if there was a 0% budget increase, the city would fall behind. It's the fact. It, it's, we have a $2 billion infrastructure ever, that is out there that we have to maintain, and we have to spend so much money every year. I mean, it's it's just the reality of having roads and storm sewers and bridges and facilities. The public will get another chance to sound off on the budget on February 12th. Dennis Ward, TBT News. Council continues to debate the proposed 2014 budget tonight. That meeting got underway just a few minutes ago. Now, there were a number of attempts to make cuts to the document last night following the public consultation. Cultural grants and dollars for facilities like the community auditorium remain on the chopping block after more information was requested. An attempt to cut money from the Clean, Green and Beautiful program was defeated, but it was the price of water that kept council debating until midnight. Some wanted to see the proposed rate hike of 6% cut in half. Councillor Andrew Folds believes that that decrease would only look good politically. Our citizens have done the heavy lifting. We're going to get to a lower percentage earlier. I think we have to stay the course. It's difficult, it's a difficult decision, but it's the right decision to do. The majority of council voted to push ahead with the 6% increase this year. Since 2010, water rates have jumped by nearly 50% and they're expected to go up by a further 3% next year. Mayor Keith Hobbs presented his State of the City address at a Chamber of Commerce breakfast this morning and the Mayor used the opportunity to try and address some of the issues the Chamber raised in a recent report on city spending. Mike Albany's reports. Late last month, the Thunder Bay Chamber of Commerce released a report saying the city's operating costs are too high and property taxes could rise almost 8% over the next four years. Mayor Keith Hobbs used today's event as an opportunity to examine those claims in front of a business community audience. A great showing from the business community and uh, they want to know how their tax dollars are being spent and I touched uh, quite a bit on that. I talked about how tax, uh, taxes have been decreased for business uh, over the last four years and uh, how projected for this year they're going to decrease as well. Hobbs also touched on infrastructure spending and the need to keep Thunder Bay's buildings standing and the streets paved. He says if you want those things done, you are going to have to pay. 
But Chamber of Commerce President Charla Robinson is more concerned with the operating costs. We're concerned about the ongoing increase of costs at City Hall. Within the operating budget, we know that the infrastructure uh, budget is a, is a different thing, and we know that infrastructure investments are very important to the long-term success of the community. However, the ongoing increase in operating costs is a concern because it's what we all pay for. The City and the Chamber are working on patching things up after Hobbs called the Chamber's City Spending Report irresponsible and based on false assumptions. Hobbs says the feud is a natural result of two passionate organizations oriented towards the same goal. I still take exception to some of the things in their report. Some of the things uh, pointed out some great things the city are doing, but I think their tax numbers were all wrong. We have a chart today that we produced showing the actual tax decreases. Um, you know, they're a good partner of ours, and um, it's a little blip in the radar as far as I'm concerned, bump in the road, and uh, we're good. Both the city and the chamber will be meeting again within the next week. Mike Albanese, TBT News. Members of the public were given another chance last night to weigh in on the future of the Fort William Gardens. The aging facilities days may be numbered as the city prepares for a proposed new event center. Bill Darlington has more on last night's meeting. Questions were addressed this evening as part of the second open house to figure out what to do with the Fort William Gardens if the event center is given the green light. A few options have been narrowed down but the main concept appears to be around maximizing the use of the space. Maximize the usage of this facility. Try to get as many people flowing through the project as possible, through the facility as possible. That really means don't make it cater to a single user group, but in fact make it a cater or accommodate the community at large. That catering is important to revenue generation. Currently, the gardens cost the taxpayers around $500,000 a year after revenue. One of the options that was mentioned was demolishing the whole building, but that would cost the city around $3 million, and the sale of the land is estimated at around 10% of that. One of the large deciding factors is the loss of the rink, and if another existing rink could be modified to fill the void. Well, A, they're smaller facilities, they don't have the volume of space, um, they're not as large as this facility, so you've got a combination of increased staff here, increased volume of space, increased surface area to, to worry about heating and cooling, and this gets a lot more use as well from a spectator event perspective. If the council goes forward with the event centre, this building as a spectator ice facility becomes redundant. What we're ultimately going to be suggesting is that what we should be doing is actually planning for a new twin pad, not a twinning of an existing single pad because that's not overly efficient, it's, it's costly, um, but actually build a new a twin pad arena at the Delaney site. Over the next few weeks, public opinion and costs will be considered and put into a preliminary report to be presented to the council in March. Bill Darlington, TBT News. A new effort to improve relations with Thunder Bay's First Nations community is about to be unveiled. The Walk a Mile short documentary series hopes to provide people with a better understanding of the Aboriginal population and issues that affect their community. The project was sponsored by several local businesses and organizations. Michelle DeRosier of Thunderstorm Productions says the sponsors not only wanted to see the project completed, but to use the series as a tool for bettering relations and improving understanding in not just the community, but within businesses and other organizations as well. From um, sort of coming to terms with some of the issues uh, that we are facing in the community, to treaties, to uh, building relationships. I think sometimes you, you won't know, you won't be able to see, you know, there's not, we can't really do sort of, we're not going to be doing sort of post-testing or anything like that, right? But I think and I hope that we'll see that by a, a stronger community and we'll see that by um, a decrease in, in racist attitudes towards some of the First Nations people in the community. I think it takes people on an individual basis to come to uh, uh, an experience that um, you know, opens their uh, eyes a bit or opens their mind a little bit, uh, allows them to see a different perspective that they hadn't considered before because of, you know, a lack of understanding or a lack of knowledge of, uh, of uh, uh, someone else's experience. The series will premiere tomorrow evening at the Community Auditorium at 7 p.m. The number of local victims in a wide-ranging ATM fraud scheme continues to grow. Thunder Bay Police say they've now received 77 reports of fraudulent withdrawals from people's bank accounts involving a wide number of financial institutions. 
The thefts were first reported on Monday after several illicit withdrawals were made from New York City during Super Bowl weekend. Police say they're still trying to determine where and how the debit card and PIN number information was obtained. Local banks and credit unions have also been working with affected customers to assist them with their losses. Santa Bay police are looking for a thief armed with a hatchet following the city's latest convenience store robbery. It happened around 6.30 this morning at the Mac store in South Waterloo Street. Police say the masked thief confronted the store employee and demanded cash. He then made his getaway after being given what police describe as a very little bit of money. The culprit's described as being Native Canadian, about 18 to 25 years old, and 5'9", with a slender build. Anyone with information on the theft is asked to contact Thunder Bay Police. A correction to a piece we brought you last evening on the TBT News Hour. It involved a story on a bed bug infestation at Spence Court. During presentation of that story, one of the tenants interviewed, Mr. James Yankee, was incorrectly identified. We apologize for the error. Residents of Armstrong have been given the green light to resume using the town's drinking water. A boil water advisory was imposed last month following a mechanical failure at the Armstrong water treatment plant. Now the district health unit says all necessary repairs have been completed and bacterial samples indicate the water supply is safe. Residents were forced to boil their water for almost three weeks. A province-wide review of the operations of the local health integration networks came to the city today. The Standing Committee on Social Policy was here to look at the operations of the Northwest then and to gain input on just how well it's functioning. The aim of the review is to determine whether to broaden the mandate of the LINs and to assign more responsibility for health care to them. It's also looking for feedback on areas in which the organizations have excelled as well as areas that need improvement. Um, what I did here is, you know, get more communication. I think that communication becomes a critical component. Um, communicate, communicate, communicate. And uh, so we will continue to look at how we can move that forward. We're certainly working on several strategies right now to improve our website, uh, to look at how we release information, to get it out to the broader public. Uh, what I did here today is that health service providers might have the information, but the public are feeling that they maybe are not as well informed. And we will certainly take that information back and build that into our communication strategy. A very, very creative ideas was shared for the first time. We heard it today about how do we move on bringing primary care under the Hospice to the Lynn. Uh, so uh, very, uh, very broad representation of people and very interesting, good ideas. Kokachinsky says they will continue to engage with people in the Northwest in order to improve on areas like chronic disease prevention and management, mental health and addiction, as well as the health care needs of the Aboriginal population. A new tool is being provided to Lake Kitty University students to keep a record of their not-for-credit accomplishments. The goal is to officially validate students out of classroom achievements. The co-curricular rec records will add another accolade on student transcripts other than grades. Participating in volunteer or non-academic activities supplied by the co-curricular website will be added to their record. The skills attained through those extracurricular endeavors like leadership, public speaking, or recruitment are all things that, will, that can ver, uh, verify and able for students to showcase. When they sign up today, can actually have their activities that they've been involved in since last September also be recognized. So it's really retroactive to last September for new students coming that join us. It's one thing to say that you participate in a lot of activities, but it's another thing to have a supervisor who confirmed that yes, you know, I have participated in these types of things. The extra recognition for those skills is designed to help students joining the workforce or applying for grad school applications. Well, many people are looking forward with great anticipation to the start of the Olympic Games. As a result of CBC scheduling changes to provide coverage of the event, there will be some changes in the airing of the TBT Late Edition. Starting on Friday night and throughout the Games, the Late Edition news will air on Global Thunder Bay beginning at 11 o'clock. That will be followed by an encore presentation on CKPR TV at 11.30. Again, the Late Edition news will switch places on Thunder Bay Television for the duration of the Olympic Games, airing at 11 p.m. on Global Thunder Bay and at 11.30 on CKPR.